I don't know. Hello and welcome to Rosie's Preserving School Pressure Canning. And uh, it's one of my favourite days today because it's mushrooms and I adore mushrooms in any form. So in any served in any way. So uh, I'm very delighted to be doing this. I've got rather a heap of mushrooms here because I'm actually doing enough for the next six months really for us while I'm doing it I'm just doing a whole load so if you've got the recipe amount that's fine you just sort of stick to that and that would be great um I'm just going to put some butter in this pan I want about four tablespoonfuls so I'll put four rings of it and then I can start putting some of the ingredients in what I'm going to do is get it on and we'll go all through to the the um, getting it in the jars and then I'll go back while we're waiting for that to vent and so on I will go through uh, I'll tell you all I've managed to learn about mushrooms um, as much as I can so on my board I've got my onions and garlic chopped up ready and I've washed my mushrooms uh, thoroughly the thing is with mushrooms, you have to be quite careful washing them. Um, I think a lot of the recipes are written from the standpoint that in places uh, kind of much bigger than ours, like Australia and America and so on, and in this country to an extent, people do go out and pick mushrooms kind of in nature. And as we mentioned right way back in the first uh, preserving classes, Botulism is all around us and it's it's majorly in soil, which is why things like potatoes, if you're going to pressure can them, you've got to scrub them really well. And you should wash mushrooms really, really well, especially if you've foraged for them. Now, the sort of mushrooms I've got here are the standard sort of supermarket white uh, mushrooms. And I don't think they've been anywhere near nature, to be honest. They've been grown in um, sort of farm conditions in a shed, probably. And the soil that they would have been grown in would have probably been sterilised anyway. Well, the substrate anyway that they're grown on. They don't so much grow in things. Uh, so I'm not too frantically worried about it, but you should be careful. And if you've got fresh produce just be careful to remove any loose soil and then give it a good wash and a scrub if necessary now there's no point me waiting for this butter to melt if I don't turn the hob on so uh there we go and then I can put the onions in and then start with the mushrooms I've got some stock ready I've got some white wine some thyme some black pepper uh, the stock already has salt in it because it's my homemade uh, salt and vegetable stock, the Vegemite that I make, uh, that we covered earlier. Um, and with the thing with mushrooms as well, when you cut them up, you shouldn't um, cut them, you should try and cut them evenly, but not leave them in lumps. The, the heat transference through this kind of mushroom in the pressure canning is poor. So you need to keep everything sort of evenly sized if you can. I'm going to slice them. You could slice and then chop them into, depending what you're going to use them for. This is kind of a soup recipe, which you can make, but I make it and then use it in lots of other things. I use these mushrooms that we're doing today as an ingredient. So when I'm making up my meals, if I want extra mushrooms or I haven't put any mushrooms in in the first place, so I put them in, I put a jar in, but I will leave them quite big, but even so that the heat transfers through them. Now, the reason you cook them first, you don't need to cook them first, but the reason that we do is to reduce the size and rigidity a little bit. Um, if you try to put sliced raw mushrooms into a jar, you wouldn't get very many in because they take up a lot of room. Uh, so the idea is to heat them up so they become more pliable. You don't have to cook them all the way through or anything like that. 
just keep them in the in this sort of basic mushroom sauce mix and then uh, they will go into the jars quite happily and once you've done this and you've got it in, on the shelf you can use it as I say just as a straightforward soup you can blend it once it's processed you can put it in the pan use a stick blender or into a food mixer you can add cream you can add anything else you want to add to your soup and uh, go from there it's just in the processing bit they need to be evenly cooked so i've got the pressure canner on but heating up ready um because we're not going to cook them for very long and i've got the butter melting in the pan and now i'm going to swoosh in all my onions and garlic oops there's a whole clove gone in there that i've missed <laughs> Take that back out again. I don't want a whole clove ending up being processed. I haven't chopped the onions majorly small because they process down and, uh, you know, become very soft in the processing. So they aren't going to be big chunks of onion, you know, in the middle of your soup. It'll all be more or less the same size. I've just chopped the garlic because I found that it um, just uh, dissolves. So I'm going to turn that right down now because otherwise the garlic and the onions will get too brown while I'm doing the slicing the um, mushrooms. Just do this other piece of garlic that decided to leap into the pan hole. Don't want that. So these very happily become one of your kind of mixers that you can bulk up other things with. And uh, I found them to be very, very useful over the time I've been pressure canning. Right, right, mushrooms, massive slicing. So try and keep them sort of fairly even, evenly sized. I mean, if you want to, you, if you've got a mandolin that you can slice fairly thick, I mean, you don't want them too thin and otherwise they're just going to sort of melt into nothing but i don't know if you can see the the size of the slices the thickness is just about two to three millimeters i would say I've got lots of 500 ml jars today. Um, that uh, 500 ml of mushroom to add into anything is plenty for us. But if you've got a bigger family, of course, you can put in more. Or if it's going to be your main ingredient to something, then make whatever size jars you need. I'm going to get a lot more done before I put them in, otherwise they're going to put too much. It doesn't matter what type of mushroom you use, if you want to get a mixture of sort of fairly exotic ones if you've got a means of uh, accessing them or if you grow them in one of the kits that's always fun to do. Uh, I haven't been that successful with the more exotic ones. I've grown a lot of these um, button mushrooms uh, very successfully and of course if you grow them you get two or three flushes 
What I tend to do with those though is to dehydrate them. And that's another very good thing to do with mushrooms is to have them dried. Then you can either rehydrate them in hot water before you need them, or you can powder them. And powdered mushroom is an incredible flavoring for things like risottos and stews and casseroles, omelets, um, just about anything really. You get a real sort of umami hit from them. So very often in risotto, I use fresh mushrooms and mushroom powder to give it an added mushroom flavor. Right. I said about uh, chopping them evenly. Similarly, you you shouldn't make mushroom soup finished. You know, you shouldn't cook it and process it, and then um, by process I mean food processing. You shouldn't uh, make it smooth and then pressure can the result because it's it is just too dense. It's like a sort of thick jelly. And you can't be sure that the heat transference is even. So make your soup up to the point of, of wanting to make it uh, smoother. Process it and keep it on the shelf like that and then process it in the food processor uh, before you um, heat it again. And you can adjust the th thickness then as well by using some corn flour and water mixed or whatever your preferred means of thickening things is, you can add it then and then stir in some cream or something just before you serve it and uh, adjust any seasoning, of course. Stir around. These are lovely, actually. I would say most of them are really, really firm, which is uh, perfect for processing. Can you see the bottom of the colander? 
And to say this is probably about six months worth of mushrooms for us. It doesn't take very long to prepare, really. And it's really, really convenient to have them just on the shelf. I'm now cutting that. <laughs> Do these last couple. Right, it's a lovely buttery, mushroomy smell. I'm just going to turn them up again slightly just to get some heating because I'm going to add the other ingredients. So I'm going to add the wine up here. If that's stir in and then it can be cooking into the actual mushrooms rather than evaporating. Time. Oh. That smells lovely. Black pepper. A teaspoon for that. I don't want to overdo it because uh, I don't want everything being super hot. And then the stock. Which I have here. And this is the Vegemite stock, which was way back in our, I think, either first or second workshop. Just vegetable, good quality peelings or 
chopped vegetables, maybe ones you don't like that you've got in a veg box or something, and then mixed with salt, kilo of veg to 250 grams of salt, uh, whisk together in the food processor, and it will just keep in a jar almost indefinitely, and you can just make it up. Then I usually put one teaspoon, one to two teaspoons in a, about two liters of water. So I don't know if you can see the pan looking nice and mushroomy. I'm just going to turn it up a bit to get the heat up in it. Move all this stuff out of the way so that I can get the jars organized. I don't know how many jars uh, it's going to make for me. I've got 500 ml ones, as I said, because that's sort of okay for us. I've got my vinegar ready. I've got my debubbler ready. Forget that. And uh, as soon as it's all hot, I'll get filling the jars over here. I've got my wide uh, funnel as well, wide mouth funnel. And you can heat up, it's all right, I don't mind. <laughs> it's always the same, isn't it? The can is heating up nicely. You can see some bubbles on the top there now, so it doesn't have to be boiling hot or anything. It's just to we don't need to actually cook it. Right, Let's see if we can get them through this funnel. My ladle. Try and get sort of even amounts of onion and liquid and mushrooms. You know, don't if you put all the stock into the first jar you're going to have to make some more to uh, top them up and i'll just use the spout of the funnel to press them down a bit but i'm going to debubble them so they'll sink a bit uh when i do that
I don't know if you can hear it over the microphones, but we've got uh, tractor after tractor all hauling uh, bales that they've uh, harvested. And they've been going day and night, so uh, the roads are absolutely chock-a-block with them around here. <laughs> but it's good, they've managed to get it in the relative dry for once. And the model, that's good. And there a minute, get my D bubble and see if I can uh, move them around a bit, get out any air pockets. They're pretty full in terms of headspace. I've got some more liquid in the pan, which I'm just going to use up in a minute when I've done them all. That's my 10 jars which is good might not last us quite six months but it's a good start if i do another batch a bit later on at the moment i'm struggling for room for these that i've done but uh, that's a good problem to have really
So what I'm going to do is share out the rest, the rest of the whiny um, juice over them. I'm not too stressed about the liquid completely covering them because um, there will be a lot of liquid in the mushroom still to come out. So uh, I'm just going to, if it covers them, it does. If it doesn't, it, I'm not going to worry about it. That one's all right. That one's done. I'm just trying to drain this and leave me out myself a few mushrooms to show you an idea of how to use them for supper or lunch. I haven't got a jar left that I can open and show you, so I'm going to do it like this. So I don't need all this liquid. I mean, if I was draining a jar to do something with mushrooms fairly dry, I would save the liquid and put it in gravy or something. I wouldn't just dump it because it's got the wine, it's got the herbs, the goodness of the mushrooms. So, you know, pour that bit in there. There we are. I'll leave those in there for a moment. Right. Sealing time. So I want my seals. Handle them by the edges so you don't make them greasy or anything. Bit of kitchen roll. I've got my vinegar ready. I'm going to wipe the jar tops. This is exactly the sort of scenario where you might spill some of this buttery, whiny juice on the jar and not see it because it's very, very pale. So it's very important that you make sure you wipe the jars. We don't want any seal failure at this stage in the game. We're over halfway through the whole series. So um, these things should be sort of not second nature exactly, but you know, so familiar that you you always do it. So that's that. On with the seal. Left. I'm going to put the rest of the vinegar in the canner to stop the uh lime scales sticking to it, to the jars and making them all white. Very annoying, it's almost impossible to get rid of. Yeah. 
I'm going to put five in the bottom and five on the next layer to sort of even it up rather than trying to jam seven in and then I can't get them out again easily. Four, five. I'm going to put in my second rack so that they're all stable. You don't have to do this. You can uh, just stack them offset so you, you put them across the join. But as they're quite little jars, I'll put the second rack in and then we won't have any problem at all. Right, that's the 10 jars, on with the lid. Oh, I'm myself. And then we wait for the vent. Good. Put that right over there on the next one. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to just sort of talk to you a little bit about mushrooms. Um, we don't really think about them very much. I don't think they're an ingredient, you know. You either love them or in the case of my grandson, load them and won't eat anything with them in. Uh, that's a personal taste. But in our Wednesday, um, uh, kind of straightforward preserving, if you know what I mean, non-pressure canning preserving workshops, we've been looking this year specifically at the origins of some of the foods that we eat and at their, their kind of nutritional properties and, and their history and so on. And I think it's fair to say that the whole thing has been a complete revelation. And mushrooms are kind of the, at the pinnacle of that, yet we pay them so little attention. I mean, it is quite sad. Um, I gave you some homework to do right back at the beginning of this series. Uh, I've always... Um, asked people to read Joanna Blythman's book, which is called Swallow This. But now there's the Chris Van Tulican book on ultra processed food and the way that it's slowly killing us. Um, even though the components of the food may be acceptable to some people as being, you know, a reasonable replacement from cooking it from scratch, they found on analysis that the, even though uh, you can make the food, it's basically made out of sort of industrial dust. I, and I don't mean that is literally dust. I mean, everything that it's made from is a dust that has been carefully manufactured to have the same ingredients as they thought that real food has, added in the right quantities, bolstered up with vitamins, um, basically what you end up with is a sort of paste which is coloured and shaped and, you know, made to look like something. But it actually has very little nutritional value whatsoever. 
adding vitamins and, and a lot of these uh, ingredients, having things added to them from kind of outside of growing things, doesn't mean that it's as good for you as if you were eating real food. And now that the populations of countries like America, Australia, Canada, and the UK, sadly, are eating 80 to 90% of this food as their everyday diet, as there is not an occasional, oh, we're just going to McDonald's and get something quick. It's every day. And I'm not saying they're eating McDonald's every day and McDonald's are no worse than anyone else. Um, I know that it's so it's supposed to be cheaper, but people are becoming so ill from it that we're really going to have to pay attention to what we're eating and do better, really, if we want to feel better. Now, it as we started the Wednesday series, we were looking at things like dairy, milk, cheese, um, we were looking at things like vinegar. We looked at bread, all these things in depth. And it became apparent week by week that actually they're all made with the same building blocks in nature, but they just end up being a different variety of food that gives us a very well-balanced diet. So the first thing I always do is study the nutrients. If I eat this, what will it do for me? Now, more is not better. So if you've got a trace element of some uh, ele a trace element of something in the in the ingredient, um, that doesn't mean to say, oh well, that's not enough to do anyone any good. It's the whole foodness of it. It's the whole thing together, and it's fascinating how most things start from yeasts and yeasts come from fungi now i can read you a list of, of what mushrooms are good for but you could equally say that for um bread or cheese or milk milk made into cheese that kind of thing vinegar we looked at making our own vinegar from natural ingredients um, the bread that we made was made from wild yeasts in the air. It had no added uh, rising agent. We didn't add yeast. It's a long, slow um, absorption over several days for the yeasts to build up. But they were just from the air and it was just flour, water, salt and yeast. And it's not difficult to see how we got to the point today because all these things have been known for thousands and thousands of years. And people were really sophisticated uh, with what they could make from their natural ingredients. So I could equally, I'm gonna read this about the mushrooms, I could equally be saying it about the milk or the vinegar or anything else. It's all the same thing. And the thing is, if you eat a natural diet, and I'm not talking about totally whole food or you know anything extreme, I just mean, properly cooked, real food, you will get all these trace elements from everything and we will be so much healthier. So mushrooms have antioxidants and all of these things do pretty much. So they're good for helping to uh, keep uh, various cancers at bay. And I don't think it's any accident actually, as I've gone over this month after month after month after month, the high levels of cancers in these so-called developed countries, um, if we're not eating any of these things that help to prevent it, how do we know really what's causing it? You can point at one thing or another and, and make an excuse, but actually if you're not feeding your body in a, in a wholesome way, then um, you're gonna run into trouble. Diabetes, it's, they're good for health, heart health because they've got vitamin C and potassium. Um, if I read to you the uh, the nutrients that they have in it, I mean, it's quite a long list. And this is a, just an ordinary mushroom. This is not anything, you know, 
mad. So they, they have riboflavin, which is B2, folate or B9, thiamine, B1, pathogenic acid or B5, niacin or B3. So that's one group of vitamins. They're low in calories, of course, you know, so they're very good. Uh, they, they have protein, three grams of protein. This is per one cup of mushrooms, which is about 250 grams or seven to eight ounces. They have carbohydrate, uh, three grams, calcium, nearly three grams, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, zinc, copper, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin D, and the folate, which I mentioned, uh, choline and ni niacin, and all the B vitamins. I mean, that's a hell of a list. For one little mushroom um and it doesn't take much incorporating of course processing like this is great because you're not you know cooking it and all the steam and all everything sort of going off in the steam it's all being trapped in the jar so it's you know a very healthy way to cook so that's what they contain i mean obviously be careful if you're um getting them from the uh, wild that goes well it doesn't go without saying but it is sort of one of those things now the other book i want to add to the two that i've already said about is a book called entangled life and it's by merlin sheldrake now i struggled with this book partly because the type was so small, but you know, I only get to read once I've gone to bed and the light's not brilliant and the type was tiny and I was it was making me really, really tired trying to read it. So I've got it on uh, my uh, phone on Audible and I'm listening to it now. It's much easier to absorb. So I haven't read the whole book, I have to say, because of that. But the bits that I have read are incredible. Um, now, what you have to understand is that fungus which is uh the the group that you know mushrooms and so on come into have been on the planet since the dawn of time they were pretty much the first thing on the planet it's felt and they have facilitated the, the development of all life plants and all animals and uh, uh, and eventually human beings by the things the way that they grow and the things that they bring uh, to the whole planet now they are such a big group 90 percent of all fungi on the planet remain unresearched undiscovered they haven't got names but they have the or that there's masses of them that have been identified, but they haven't been researched. So only 10% of them have been researched so far. But from that, they're able to tell an awful lot. And basically, you've got um, everything that's above ground that happens that we see every day, and we take for granted, and it, you know, there's trees and life and birds and grass and stuff like that but under the earth is this whole mass a communication system in fact it's called by scientists the the wood wide web and that's literally what it is and if you've ever grown mushrooms or you've ever looked at mushrooms growing the mushroom is basically the fruit of the plant not all fungi have mushrooms mushrooms are there to disperse the spores and to get the whole thing further afield get growth going and some of them have mushrooms and some of them disperse their spores in other ways but under the ground that's the bit we see the mushroom and that's the bit we eat and it, that's pretty much all anyone knows about mushrooms really if you if you'd ask me 18 months ago I'd just say oh yeah they're lovely I love them you know but I wouldn't have been able to have told you anything about their history or their evolution or what they do and 
they are kind of almost the, the, they're the stuff of science fiction, really. Under the ground, they have um, their, their shoots, which are called hyphae. And those hyphae join up into a mat, which is called the mycelium. And that spreads, it can spread for miles and miles from one organism. And that spreads a mat and wherever it goes, it's, it has no brain, but it can uh, make decisions. It can decide where it's going to grow, how it's going to grow, what it's going to live on and what other fungi it collaborates with. You'll have to read the book. It's much more complicated than that. Um, but the thing is, I mean, the biggest mycelium mat, I think, is in Oregon that has been identified so far. And it goes for 20, 26 kilometres in any direction. Um, and they've worked out how much it weighs, and I can't remember, but it's massive. But that mat can transfer information between itself, you know, send messages to the outer regions of the 26 kilometres. It can communicate with things like trees. It can carry messages. It can carry electrical charges and all kinds of other uh, nutrition. Um, and this is where it comes into kind of a special um, kind of power really, is that within a wood, a woodland setting, it will facilitate the growth of uh, and the health of the whole wood the trees in the wood and there is a mother tree which is bigger than all the other trees naturally enough and that mother tree is at the center of everything and will decide what's happening with the other trees who needs help who's struggling who's getting too tall or growing in the wrong direction or whatever and messages will be sent by the tree roots into the mycelium to the tree that needs to be, you know, helped or whatever. To the point where when a tree is felled, if the stump is left there, that stump gets supported by all the other trees through the mycelium. They treat it as a kind of elder that knows information and not exactly give advice but can influence what's going on it's by no means dead it would only be dead if it was scrubbed out and removed so if you ever see a tree trunk in the ground it's kind of like the the granddad or grandma of the wood and it's still included in this in the societal structure I think that's incredible. They do all sorts of other things, fungus, that they can be all over different settings. They can eat through rock. Some of them are adapted to uh, eat, eat rock. I don't quite know why. Um, radioactive material, if there's a radioactive spill or a leak or something, from certain... Um, species of fungi are attracted to that will move in they're attracted to the heat as much as anything and they will literally devour the radioactivity and turn it into they, they will it's the same as a tree using sunlight uh to photosynthesize um and make the sugars and so on that it needs to live on and that's also what the fungus lives on as well by accessing the tree roots it will use the nutrients and the sugar that the tree has developed but they will use that radioactivity for good turn it into you know something that is less harmful same with oil spills there are oil spill eating fungal growths that can be incorporated can be utilized or they're just to turn up naturally and uh, deal with it. I mean, I, it, it's like I say, it's almost the stuff of science fiction. And they were the beings, they were the organisms that were there when the first, they weren't even creatures, they were just groups of cells that were in the water when the earth was first formed. The fungi, fungi 
enabled growth to occur, both with plants. They've supported plants for thousands of years directly. The, the, the plant growth living on the fungus with, until they developed their own roots systems and things like that. I mean, the book is incredible and fascinating. And I think it it's changes the way that you look at the world. And if all of that has been going on, all that development for billions of years, who are we to come along and say, well, we don't want any of that. We're going to make our food out of these chemical dusts. And we're going to form that. Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll 3D print them. We'll have some 3D printed meat, and then we can get rid of cows. Well, everything has evolved to be balanced. And who do we think we are to come along and say, no, that's rubbish? It, it's mind blowing, is what it is. And that, as I say, has been going on for billions of years since the dawn of time. And here we are. The last 50 years have been the worst. It could have been the best of our lives, and I think it's absolutely been the worst of our lives. Uh, just keeping an eye on the venting started, which is good. So if you get the chance to, to access the book, have it read to you by Merlin Sheldrake himself, I must admit he's got very, uh, very quiet, calm manner, somebody who's studied fungi by literally tracing all of the roots and the, the hyphae and the mycelium right back to the source, measuring the distances that they cover. And there isn't much he doesn't know about it, I don't think. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to um, hearing the rest, rest of the book. And one of his friends did an experiment with, um, oh, whatever is it called? I can't remember what it's called. It's got a special name. It is a fungus, but it's sort of like a blob rather than rather than the strands. And uh, he kept building it, um, different models of mazes to see if the this fungus could calculate its way out to the exit of the maze. And the maze that he took was the floor plan of Ikea. Now, if you've ever been to Ikea and um, tried to find your way around, you know you will keep on going around and end up back where you started, which is always right by the meatballs outside the restaurant, isn't it? it all, all things seem to lead to there. And... Uh, and so he built, uh, he got the the floor plans of the IKEA stores, uh, I don't know how, um, and built mazes of them and put this, uh, what, I, I just can't remember the name of it, uh, put that in, this mass. And in a matter of minutes, it would go down, come back, go down, uh, reform and stop and then just go and go to the exit. And, and it has no brain. It has, hasn't got anything other than this mass of cells. And uh, it's inexplicable to our dull human brains, I think. Now, I mean, we think we're the top of the food chain. I just don't think we're very high up at all, really, when you see all this going on. And... Uh, so he's he's pretty much uh, he's lived in sort of equatorial forests and studied a lot a lot of things in uh, laboratories and all the rest of it. And I I particularly think the communication between trees is really really exciting. And uh, we've got a lot of trees all around us, and I often look at I do look at them differently now, and just don't look at them in isolation. And any time I have to prune something, I'm just there with the Clippers and just, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just think of all that's going on as a result. And he looks upon it as being we've got the world that we see around us up here, but beneath the soil is this fabulous array of uh, there's cavities where certain things go to feed off of the mycelium, there's that have been sort of excavated out, there's all sorts of structures. 
And I think that's where the no dig principle for gardening comes into its own. You know, don't keep disturbing that soil structure and certainly don't keep putting chemicals into it because the, the things that are in there have to evolve to deal with it. And they will eventually. And that's why things like um, weed killers and pesticides and things don't uh, cease to be effective because everything evolves to cope with what's being done to them. So I just think it's it's mind changing studying these things. And I'm very grateful that through these workshops, I have have studied them and continue to do so because I wish I'd studied it years ago, years and years ago. And I wish a lot of other people would as well because I don't think we do nearly as much damage to our environment. Just wipe the lock, which is spinning out. I'm nearly there. A couple of minutes to go. I certainly won't look at my mushrooms on toast in quite the same way. But the mushroom is just like an apple. It, it's just the fruit of the plant. And you don't look at an apple and think, oh, that's odd. I wonder where that came from. You know, you pretty much know it came from a tree and not what a tree looks like because you can see it. And uh, it doesn't seem remarkable. And the mushroom is the same. It's the fruit of all this growth that's going on beneath our feet. Right, now where are my weights? Here we are, all ready. I think there's another book as well, but I can't remember the name of it, which is the study that was done on the trees and how they communicate. But the the mycelia, the mycelium from the fungi are crucial in that. So they kind of overlap. And there's some uh, uh, videos on YouTube uh, as well, which are great to watch of all the studies that were done. Of the, they can prove the communication between the trees really uh, clearly and uh, I think it just makes the world even more exciting knowing all that's going on it's uh, I especially like the bit that the old trees don't get left out <laughs> I wish that applied to, to our lives as well it doesn't really <laughs> Now the lock is up, so that's good. And I've got the weight here. I'm going to use my towel to just put it on because I'm fed up with burning my hand on it. Right, put the weight on and we'll wait for it to get up to pressure and then I'll put the timer on. I'm just going to get the things out that I want to show you for what I'm going to do for supper because this is going to take an hour. Um, so I think what we'll do is look at the, the what I'm going to show you and then We'll finish uh, recording because at the end of the hour, you're just going to lift the jars out. So, you know, you won't need any help with that. Um, and I'll just get this ready and then we can. Look at that once it's up to pressure. So I'll see you in a few minutes.
Right, here we are back again. Just trying to get some cheese. It's one of those wax covered ones, which is really annoying. <laughs> Comes in the veg box and they always put it in when they haven't got the cheese I've ordered. And uh, it's very, very strong and not one I'm keen on. So um, I'm going to use it in this. Now, what I'm going to do is make a quiche with some of the mushrooms. Uh, now, if you if I was using a jar, I'd drain the jar, and as I said, I would keep the stock to use in a gravy or casserole or something. Uh, but I've kept back some of the filling that's gone into the jar because I haven't I haven't got any other mushrooms that I can use. Now, this quiche is made. You see it there? Looks all lumpy, bumpy. It's made from mashed potato. Uh, rather than pastry and we had mashed potato last night with some sausages and brown beans and I, we made more mashed potato than needed. I chopped in some uh, chives into it. It was already mashed with milk and seasoning and then I just spread it in this uh, flan tin, it's a loose bottom tin and baked it at about 180 for about 30 minutes to crisp it up. And that was yesterday. I mean, you could do it the same day if you want, but uh, we were having that last night. So I thought it's a good, good way to do it. So he's making all the pastry, rolling it out and all the rest of it. I'm not a great fan of making pastry <laughs> these days. I used to do lots and lots of it, but nowadays I just think life's a bit short. Uh, so I use, uh, I, I've used the mashed potato. Now, if you pretend that this is a jar that I've opened and drained, I'm just gonna spread the mushrooms in there. I'll try and get them in without all the juice. I don't want any wetness going on really to make the potatoes soggy so that's that and I'm just going to spread them out I think I've just about got enough in there move that chicken out of the way Spread them out evenly. Now you can use any filling, of course, if you want bacon in there or you want, you could put some bacon or ham in with the mushrooms. You could not use mushrooms. You could use something else. You could use any quiche filling, in fact, in the same system. Now it hasn't got, it shrunk down a bit, the potatoes, so I'm not going to overfill it. What I've got is a couple of eggs, that's all. Now crack into a jug. And find something to mix it with, which I haven't got, of course. I'll just use a spatula. Mix it round. Bit of bit more. Um, seasoning possibly, or well, the potato seasoned and the mushrooms are, a little bit of black pepper and a few grains of salt, it's already got thyme in the mushrooms there. You could put a bit of cream in if you've got it, you know, or if you've got sort of real milk, the top of the milk as well you could use and just pour that over the two eggs is just about right in there because it has shrunk down a bit and then I've got my grated cheese the cheese we don't particularly like to eat as cheese because it's very very strong I'm just going to grate over the top it would be perfect for this because it will really add a lot of flavour. So you need to just pop that back or put it in a uh, 
pottish oven about 180 i would say for about 20 minutes 15 20 minutes to set the egg and melt the cheese and get a bit of color on the top and there we have we'll probably have this for lunch tomorrow to be honest because we've already got dinner sorted for tonight but um Oh, we're up to the temperature, so I'm going to start timing. Put that there for you to have a look at. And I'll put the timer on. I'm going to turn this down to three. I'll put the timer on. I've got a small jar for the 60 minutes. For these jars. Yeah, that timer's on. So there you've got nice uh, cheese, um, peach, cheese and mushroom quiche. It'll all look lovely when it's cooked. And we'll have that for lunch tomorrow with some uh, a bit of salad and some tomatoes or something like that out of the garden. So if you've come in from where, I mean, these, you could make them the mashed potatoes uh, plan bases and freeze them I would think uh, I would think it would freeze okay mashed potato freeze is fine and then you could just take it out and fill it and pop it in the oven to finish off and that's all with your jar of mushrooms which isn't soup isn't casserole so I'm just something a bit different so um, okay well I've put my uh, timer on for 60 minutes and so when that's done, I should just take the jars out and leave them overnight. So I'm going to leave you there for today. And then next time we come back, it will be potatoes. <laughs> so I'll see you then.